You knew who would be here tonight. You knew exactly what is needed. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit come upon me now, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I take your authority over every evil spirit. There is nothing from hell. There is nothing from the devil. There's nothing from mankind that can hinder the word of the living God when God determines to work. So touch me. Let the fire of God come down tonight. Thank you for your presence tonight, Holy Spirit. Making Jesus known to us, real to us. Now bring the word, O oh God. Bring people back tonight. Those who have been drifting, those who have been backslidden, bring them back tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You that love the Lord, this message is not for you, but we want you to pray. There are many here tonight that need to hear this word. This is a good tape you'll be able to give to backsliders later. We're not trying to sell them. And by the way, the tape from this morning, we decided to, to make them anyhow, so they'll be available to you uh, when a, a week or so down the road. The awful consequences of backsliding. God said to the prophet Hosea, my people are bent in backsliding from me. And what that means in Hebrew, my people habitually, they have a habit of drifting away from me, turning their backs on me. He said, my people have always had that tendency. That's a habit with my people. That's the habit of all of Israel. You read the history and the story of Israel, one generation after another, backsliding. I heard a preacher say backsliding is not in the Bible. Then he didn't know his Bible. It's all through the Scripture. The heart cry of Jeremiah was, Turn back, Israel. Turn back to the Lord, O backsliding Israel, for the Lord is married to you. Our Israel and Judah habitually backslid from God. And Jeremiah, all through the book of Jeremiah, you hear him cry, O oh Lord, our iniquities testify against us. Our backslidings are so many. We have sinned against thee, O oh God. In Jeremiah 5, 6, Jerusalem's transgressions are many, and their backslidings keep increasing. Their backslidings increasing. You find this term all through the Bible, backsliding, turning back on God. God's people mostly backslide in times of prosperity and blessing. When God is blessing you, you've got his favor, that's the time to beware. That's the time that backsliding usually comes to God's people. Listen to it. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me. they sworn by those that are not gods. When I fed them to the full, then they committed adultery. They have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have backslidden against me when I fed them to the full. I blessed them, I favored them, and then they turned their back on me. Jeremiah describes perfectly who the backslider is. The backslider, whether it's a he or she, is that child of God who has enjoyed the blessing and favor of the Lord, someone who's walked with God, devoted, loved the Word of God, loved to pray, walked in holiness, gentle, kind perhaps, Someone who said, I'm going to always serve him with all my heart. But now something has drawn the heart away. There's no more genuine love. The heart has grown cold in love toward the Lord. They no longer seek him. They no longer go to his word. Prayer is gone. They become foolish. They're without understanding. Their conversation changes. They don't talk the way they used to talk. There's a hard time getting them into the house of God. They don't testify of the love of Jesus to their friends or their co-workers anymore. They have grown cold and backslidden from the Lord. And the Bible makes it clear, and listen very closely. The Bible says it's a very evil and bitter thing to backslide against the Lord. Their own wickedness shall correct them. Their backsliding shall reprove them. Know therefore and see that it's an evil thing and a bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God, and that his fear is no longer in you, saith the Lord of hosts. He said, I planted you as a noble vine. I planted you holy as a right seed. How then have you turned away from me and become a generate plant of a strange vine unto me? God says, how could you have walked away from me when I planted you and I tried to establish you and you've turned away from me? Now, Jonah 
is the type of the backslider in the Word of God. And I want you to go to the book of Jonah, and uh, we're, we're going to look at this backslider. And I'll tell you what, get the book of Jonah and just leave it open on your lap, please. Book of Jonah, and leave it open while I talk to you about the awful consequences of backsliding. You know the story. Look this way for just a moment. Here's a prophet of God. He's called of God. He loves God. He, he is walking close enough to God that God could speak to his heart and tell him to go to a wicked city and wake it up. He said, rise and go to Nineveh, that wicked city, and prophesy against it. Folks, listen to me. This is a man of God. Jonah, nobody gets that kind of a call unless he's walking close to the Lord. He had to be standing in the presence of God. And God says, you go now and you preach, repent or perish. Arise, go to Nineveh. Now, instead of arising and going to Nineveh, he arises and goes to Joppa, about 35 miles north of Jerusalem, a seaport town, and he buys a ticket on a cargo ship headed for Tarshish. You've heard of this in the Bible of the ships of Tarshish. Tarshish means prosperity, success, and power. How many people do you know that have boarded a ship toward Tarshish? That's their whole mindset now, to get prosperity, wealth, and success. Isn't it amazing that this man of God would buy a ticket and he goes into the down into the hold of the ship where the cargo is, maybe way up in the stern of the boat, and he crawls up in a blanket and he falls asleep. Now, folks, somewhere, I don't know how long it took. It doesn't say when the storm hit. But there was a storm that God had arranged to come to that Mediterranean Sea. And I want you to see, we, we, we know this story and we know that Jonah sleeps through a storm because God himself sent a mighty hurricane. It wasn't sent from the devil. God stirred up the whole storm to get to one man who's in disobedience. One man who's backsliding. I don't know how, per perhaps it was the first week. This is probably a three to four week, tr week trip in the Mediterranean, those old sailboats. They're, they're on a trade route. There are other boats coming and going on this trade route to Tarsus. These ships of Tarsus went back and forth. That was in Spain. They, they left from Joppa near Israel and from other seaport towns, from, from uh, Greece and Turkey and all of those seaports, Macedonia, and they would go to Tarsus and back. Tarsus is where they smelted uh, lead, they smelted other uh, coppers and so forth, and they took these metals all over the Mediterranean. And this storm hits out of nowhere, and that boat begins to toss. The rudder is useless. The sails are ripped apart, and the sailors are crying out to their gods. I picture these seasoned sailors. They've never been in a storm like this. They know it's something beyond they've never seen. It's a hurricane beyond all hurricanes. And that wooden boat is being tossed. It's shipped. Uh, it's being tossed everywhere. They go down in the hold of the boat and they get up out of the car. They take all the cargo and throw it overboard to lighten it. That, that boat, that ship is being tossed to and fro. I can picture those sailors going into their duffel bags and pulling out their little, little silver and gold gods. Some of them have ivory gods and they're standing there kissing their gods. I've seen people like that in trouble kissing the crucifix, holding the crucifix and kissing the little crucifix. I've, I've seen people, they used to have these little uh, things on the dashboard, these little angels. And before they take a trip, they kiss the angel. I can see these, sages, uh, these sailors kissing everything that they think is divine. I mean, they are crying out and they are praying. <laughs> Backslider, I'm going to tell you something. Jonah is in the belly of that ship sleeping through this storm. Somehow he misses even all the racket of them going down into the cargo where he's at, the cargo bay, and they're removing all this, and they're screaming, and they're praying, and somehow they miss him. And he's down there fast asleep. Now I want to tell you, that's not the sleep of unconcern. That's not the sleep of a lazy man. It's another kind of sleep. It's the sleep of sorrow. It's a man who knows he's running from God. It's a man who knows that his, his conscience is troubled. He knows that he has no future. He has ruined his ministry. 
Everything is gone. He's made the wrong move. He is moving away from God. He, he's in the midst of a ship absolutely running from God. His conscience is pounding him. He's probably had a week or two on that boat saying, what am I doing here? How could I have done this? I've made a wrong decision. But I've turned my back on the Lord. I've turned my back on the call of God. And this man has had probably a week or two battling in his conscience and he's weary and he's worn. Folks, I'll tell you, it's a terrible thing to have to fight a conscience that God has got a hold of. It's a terrible thing to try to sleep at night when you know you're running from God. And you remember being in the house of God. You remember being meetings just like this. You were on fire for God. You loved the Lord and He called you. He put His hand on you. And here you are now trying to go to bed at night because you have compromised and you have turned your back and you're running away from the Lord. And you say, oh, I sleep, Brother Dave. No, my Bible says there's no rest to the wicked. There's no rest. Oh, you may sleep, but I'll tell you what it is, the sleep of a condemned person, condemned by your conscience, saying, do you remember his touch? Do you remember his arms around you? Do you remember his love? Do you remember that he has a city prepared for you? Do you remember all the promises he made to you? Do you remember what it was like to be so close to him? Oh, this man was sleeping, but it was a sleep of sorrow. This man wore him out. His conscience is worn out. He's worn out by sin. He's worn, about, worn out replaying it. He's worn out knowing that, that his reputation is gone. Everything, he blew it. Oh, there are a lot of people that have that deep sleep upon them. They're, they're just in some kind of a daze now. Do you think for a minute that God's going to stand by and let the devil take you away from him? Do you think for one minute that Lord's just going to sit by while, while the devil comes with, with all kinds of temptations and tries to get you away from him? He bought you with his own blood. He's not about to sit by idly and let you go. He's going to storm, he's going to send a storm into your life and get you back. Mm hmm. God wasn't going to sit back and let his man run. He never sits back and lets his people run. Oh, folks. I'm going to tell you something. There are three awful consequences that you have to understand. If you are running from God, if you're backslidden, or you, the devil has been trying to get you to backslide, I want you to hear me. As you've never heard any preacher in your lifetime. Consequence number one of backsliding. When you backslide, you become one of the most dangerous persons on earth. I don't want to be near you. Jonah, the moment he stepped on that boat, was the most dangerous man in the Mediterranean. Because God was after him. Every sailor who sailed with him is in danger. I don't know how many boats got tossed on that trade route. Not only that boat, but all the boats coming and going. And there could have been hundreds of sailors weeping and crying. Because you see, when you run from God, when you backslide, you can't say, this is just my sin, this is my problem, I'm hurting nobody but myself. I've heard that from drug addicts all my life, alcoholics, prostitutes, it's my body, I'm only hurting myself, nobody else is my problem. Oh no, it's not just your problem, it's the problem of everybody that lives with you, walks with you, and knows you, you are a dangerous person because God's after you. Not to hurt you, but oh, you're going to go through it. The Lord sent a great wind. The captain goes down. I don't know why. He's probably going down to expect the beams of the boat to see if it's still holding together. To see how much water they're taking on. The waves are coming over the boat. The rudder is useless. There's no sails left. And, and he looks up way up there in the stern and there's a man rolled up in a ball snoring. You know something? God may have a controversy with one sinner, one backslider, and affect so many people while he's dealing with him. 
A lady wrote to me recently. She said, Pastor David, my preacher dad backslid. He resigned his church and he left mom, his wife and my mother, and picked up with some ungodly woman, absolutely backslid. Not only did he backslide, but he caused all my brothers and sisters to backslide. And she said, Brother Dave, he calls me telling me I'm a phony and I need to stick with my family and my father's trying to get me to backslide. She said, thank God he hasn't touched me and God's been keeping me. You see, when you backslide, you don't only affect yourself, you affect, you affect the whole family. Here's a father and a, a husband who's been delivered from drugs, for example. And the Lord touches his life, begins to restore him, brings him back to his family. The little children now are so excited, daddy's home. This is true, case after case, but I'm thinking one in particular. Three precious little children. Now he has a good job when he comes home from work and they crawl up in his lap and they laugh and they play and she is happy. God has answered her prayer. Her husband is home. Daddy's home. And God is blessing. Everything is favorable. God is blessing in a marvelous way. But one day the tempter comes and he goes back into a back room with a bag of stuff and snorts. And he's caught. He goes home that day and his wife, there's a terrible fear comes over her because she sees something on his face he hasn't seen in a year. She says, oh God, don't let it be. Because she knows when he comes sniffing and his eyes are red. She's been there, she's seen it many times. And within a week she knows he's hooked again. Because the next day and the next week, he's there at noon, he's there at three o'clock, coming back, getting drinking water and trying to drink coffee and trying to come out of the days. And she knows now that when he goes off at eight o'clock in the morning, he's not going to his job, he lost his job. And he's back on the streets. And now those three little children are bitter and they are mad. They're mad at God, they're mad at dad, they're mad at mom, they're mad at the whole world. And that father who said, it's my body, it's my problem. No, you're a dangerous man. You're destroying everything around you. And now you destroy open the grandchildren that were in your womb, in, or in your loins. You, those wonderful grandchildren that you could have had, they're not going to be there. Because you're a dangerous man. Because God sends storms. He's going to come. I don't know if you heard about it in the news this week. Here in New York City and Wall Street, one of the top Wall Street brokers of all times. I mean handling multi, multi millions of dollars for his corporation. One of the Wall Street firms here. And he got hooked on heroin. And heroin sweeping all through Wall Street now. And he would, just before he had business deals, he would snort heroin. And the stuff that's on the streets now is almost 75% pure. And it can kill you. And he got hooked. Lost his job. And got his wife hooked. Another Wall Street broker. And in the New York Times, on Saturday... They told us their story. And you know where they are now? They're in a city shelter here in New York. They've lost millions of dollars. They lost their home, lost their family, lost everything. The man's out of his mind. No, you don't hurt just yourself. It's not just your body. Nobody lives and dies to themselves. When David sinned in numbering Israel, he was a dangerous man. Why? Why? Because God, when he sent his judgment on David, 
sent judgment on Israel and 70,000 innocent men died. Now, I don't know how innocent they are because the Bible said they were into idolatry. God may have been dealing with them, but I want you to know that one man's sin cost the life of 70,000 men. Backslidden, backslidden Christians are sending a lot of people to hell on their jobs. There was a time you went into the you went into your job, you had a Bible on your desk. You were a testimony. There was something about your countenance made you different. You went to church, you tried to get everybody else on your job to go to your church. You were so excited about Jesus, and now they know there's a change, and then they see you. They see you going down. They see you backslid, and they know something's wrong. They can't figure out the spirituality of it, but they know something's different about you now. You're just like them. And you were their last hope. They looked at you, and even though they may have mocked you, they said, well, at least I know there's somebody I can go to and I'm in trouble. There's somebody I know that may prove that there may be a God. But now you robbed them of that hope. You become dangerous. The second consequence of backsliding, you're going to be rebuked by the world. Not just by the Holy Ghost. The world's going to stand up and rebuke you. This captain comes to Jonah fast asleep and he shakes him. You know what he said? What meanest thou, O sleeper? Rise and call upon God. Now, isn't that something? A heathen captain commanding a preacher to get on his face. Get down and pray, preacher. Who are you? What does this mean? And suddenly, Jonah shakes himself and he wakes and he feels the boat tossing and suddenly he hears the screaming of the sailors and he knows, he looks at the water filling the hull of the boat and he says, uh oh, uh oh. Oh, no, he caught me. It's, it's God. It's God. He crawls up on deck. And he says, gentlemen, this is all about me. I'm a backslider. I'm running from God. And all those sailors said, how can you do this? How can you run from your God? How can you run from him? Why are you bringing all of this trouble on us? In other words, did your God fail you? Did your God beat you? Did your God not love you? Were you so afraid of him you had to run from him? What kind of God do you serve, Jonah? You know, Paul, the apostle, he was on a boat that was tossed in a horrible hurricane. But he wasn't running from God. And that man could stand before all the devils of hell, and he could stand on that rocking boat and say, Don't worry, gentlemen, not one of you is going to be lost. I heard from God last night. My Lord told me we're all going to be saved. There was a time some of you could say that. You could stand up in any storm, in any crisis, and say, my God is able. But now you're a coward, just like Jonah. Jonah had no power whatsoever. He couldn't command the storm. He couldn't bring hope. He had no message. He had nothing. He was weak. He was a coward. And that's what sin does to you. It takes away your dignity. It takes away your strength. It takes away your power. and makes you a coward before all mankind. And you know what happens? You present to the Lord a very unattractive salvation. You make it seem to the sinner that it's more profitable to be a sinner than to be a Christian because they come to you now and say, why are you so irritable? See, you're backslidden now. Where is that smile that was on your countenance at one time? Why is it people don't come and unburden our problems to you anymore? Why don't you ask me to your church anymore? It's been ages since you asked me to go to Times Square Church. And that's what the sailors are saying. How can you do this to your God? How did it happen? You're irritable now because you've got problems you never had before. You've got fear. You have guilt. You have condemnation. 
And you know that God's coming. That the Lord's not going to let you get by because you told him, you gave him your heart. You said you're going to serve him for life and he took you at your word. And he put his blood on you. Jesus sprinkled his blood on you. That's my blood. I died. That's my shed blood. I paid the price. You're mine. And I'm not going to let you go. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll take, I will take any drastic action I have to take to keep you. I'll put you in a killer storm if I have to. I'll put you in the belly of a whale if I have to, but I'm not letting you go. Mm. There should, listen to me now, there should be no area in life where we as Christians should make it seem more attractive to serve the devil than to serve the Lord. In every area of life, we ought to have the gentleness, the smile, the kindness, the goodness, the grace, we should be a testimony to the whole world. Serve Jesus. He satisfies. He makes a way where there's no way. He'll see you through any storm. That should be the testimony. But the backslider has lost that testimony. He has no testimony. Backslider, you have no testimony. Tell anybody you want what it used to be like serving Jesus, but that's not a testimony. It has no power. It doesn't mean a thing. You brought a bad report. You brought a slander on the Christian walk. You see, when, when, well, let's go to consequence number three so I can get to this. Consequence number three. God is going to take you down into the lowest pit known to man. You're going on a whale of a trip. Pardon the pun. God's got a fish ready for you. I want you to listen to me, please. If you're a backslider here tonight, you've got to hear this. No man, no woman on earth has ever escaped what we are reading here. No one has ever gotten away with it. I want you to go to Jonah, the first chapter. 11, beginning to read verse 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not for the sea wrought was tempestuous against them. Folks, look at me, please. First of all, God sends a crisis to your life. If you're running from the Lord, if you're backslidden, if you're not in a crisis, mark it down, it's coming. The crisis of your life, the storm of your life, you are going to be tossed and turned inside out, upside down. I mean, you are going to go through it. If you, if you thought... You had it rough before. Just wait. No one can escape this storm. Now, some of you are already in it. You're beginning to taste it. You're beginning to go through it. You don't understand. There'll be friends just like these friends. There'll be people who try to shield you from it. They, they kept rowing, trying. We don't want this man to be thrown overseas. They pictured him being eaten by sharks within a few hours. And, 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 and these are ungodly men, but they, they, they were moral men, evidently. And, and said, no, we can't do that to you, sir. And so they're rolling, trying to get it. They're trying to shield him from the hand of God. But you see, God's already made up his mind. And you can row all you want. You can have all your friends try to shield you, and it's not going to work. Because God has a purpose. He's after you. Not to hurt you. Not to kill you. But to deliver you. And bring you back to his first love. And, and, and so they're rowing. They, they said, we can't do it. But God would let up. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah. 
and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Folks, after the storm comes the most critical, dark moment of your life. That's called the pit of despondency and despair. Jonah, in the belly of the whale, confessed. He said, I have gone down to the bottoms of the mountains, the deepest recesses of the earth. That whale went down. Do you know what it was like? There's total darkness in the belly of that whale. There's no light down under the sea. There's just a little bit of oxygen. Now, folks, sea pressure, even in submarines, they have to have it pressurized when they go down. They're, they're trying to dig up the, the remains of that 800 flight, and they have this little submarine, this little submarine, rescue submarine. It has to be pressurized. Folks, I don't know how God did this, but his, his eardrums had to be pounding at the pressure and seaweed all over his head and all over his body and every fish that is, that is being in and, and that whale trying to digest that food. Can you imagine him in this stinking mess of darkness and everything else? Folks, that's a picture, backslider, of where you're headed. I had a message I preached years ago called Seaweed Prophets. I went down to the bottom of the mountains, he said. Backslider, there's going to come a night of darkness for you. Terrible darkness. Absolute despair and despondency. This is what hit Jonah in the belly of the well. And that's why God swallowed him up and let him be down there because, you see, God's looking. There's only two options that you have when you go down into the, the belly of this crisis that God brings to the backslider. There's only two options. One, you give up to despondency. And you say to yourself, well, God, I, I have so backslidden, I'm so far down, I can't get back to God. And you let despair rule your life. You go down into the pits of depression. You say, I have so failed God. I'm in such a mess. There's no hope for me. And I'm going to tell you something. Jonah could have very easily given in to that spirit of despondency. And he could have died in the belly of that well. And he could have been uh, swallowed up by the well, eaten by that well, digested by that well, and never be heard of again. You say, well, well, God had a mission for him. No, God can find somebody else. God can find somebody else. Because we have our own free will. We have a free will. And he had to make a choice when that came. And some of you who have backslidden from the Lord, some of you who were so close to Jesus, and you're sitting here tonight, you've already seen what it's like when you get away from his presence. How empty and cold and dark and damp, and wearisome, and the despondency, and the despair, and the guilt, and the condemnation, and the fear. Your conscience. Running from God is the hardest thing in the world. What a tragic thing it is. But folks, when you get down in the bottom of despair, when, when you are despondent and full of fear and anxiety, you have to make a choice. Thank God Jonah made the right choice. Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and you heard my voice. I have, an event, I have a, a preacher friend. He was a preacher. Loved him dearly a number of years ago. He was the sweetest, gentlest man you'd ever meet. Sweet and gentle, and I mean in a manly way. But he was so kind. He'd go anywhere, do anything for anybody. And I loved him because he was, he, he was, he was a simple, 
trusting man. He had some trouble in his marriage. And I, I noticed each time I would see him, he was just a little, a little cooler than he was before, a little more despondent. And I didn't know what was happening. But one day I got a, a telephone call that he'd resigned the ministry. He'd left his family and was running around with a, a lady drug addict. And by the time I got to him, the storm had hit. And he was in the storm of his life because that woman who thought he thought was going to be answered all of his needs couldn't satisfy him. He was miserable. Not only that, she had got him on pot. And when I sat with him outside of a, a building, I, I had called them to come and visit me, and we were sitting outside. I remember three chairs, and I'll never forget the look on his face. He's smoking pot now. Not only that, he was selling it. And I looked at him, and he wouldn't even look at my eyes. He couldn't even lift up his eyes. They were two of the most miserable people. Because you see, she once knew the Lord, and she backslid too. And now on drugs. And now she's sitting there thinking, not only am I on drugs, but I brought a man of God down. And I caused the preacher of the gospel of Jesus to go to drugs. Can you imagine her despair? She was in the belly of the well. She was totally despondent. And I said, I still love you, sir. I said, the Lord loves you. And I'm here to tell you, I'm your friend. And I want you to let me take you by the hand and bring you back to the Savior. The Lord will restore everything the canker worm has eaten. He said, Brother David, I'm too far gone. I've sinned too much against Jesus. And no way he could forgive me for what I have done to him and the reproach I've brought on his name. There's no way. Folks, I sat there for two hours trying to persuade him, using scriptures, did everything. I couldn't bring him out of that pit of despair and despondence. I couldn't get him out. In fact, in the next three years, I kept trying telephone calls. And every time I'd go into his city, I would get a hold of him. And I found he was deeper and deeper. Just one time there was a glimmer of hope. But I couldn't reach him. You know what he did? He had two options. He could either in the belly of the well, when he's down and despairing and feeling that God has given up on him, there's no hope, he can't get back. If all he had done is out of the belly of that hell, cried to God, said, oh God, I've sinned against you. Deliver me. The Lord would have been there immediately. The Lord would have delivered him. I, I don't know what's happened to him. I've lost touch. Last I heard, he was far gone. And what about you tonight, sitting here? And you said, Brother Dave, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how far down I've gone. I have ministers that, 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 that come, even to this church. They'll come and visit from all over the country, and they'll meet me backstage. And Occasionally, I'll, I'll know their names because they, they had a measure of, of notoriety, or, or, or they were familiar. They were quite famous in their time. I, I remember one who, when I was a boy, he was on, on television and radio, one of the best-known men, and he came to one of my meetings. And when I, you've heard me tell about it. He came up and he told me his name, and I, I was aghast. His wife was leading him. He, he had eyes, but it, she was leading him like a blind man. I went to shake hands with him, and, and it was this. he handed this to me, a dead fish. I didn't know what to do with it. This man... His, was, by the time he met me, he'd been in that condition for 20 years. 20 years. One of the most fiery, powerful preachers in America was a dead fish. Why? 
because in his despair, that man got so despondent for a whole year he'd hardly come out of his house. He said, there's no way. I, I brought more reproach than any man probably in history. I brought reproach and he couldn't get away from the reproach. He couldn't get away from all of that. And he wallowed in that despair and it destroyed him. And I'm telling you, consider tonight, and, and if you don't get a hold of this now and say, I have two options and I'm going to take the right one. I'm telling you, you can die in your despair. You can die in despondency. You can allow yourself to wallow in that fear and wallow in that guilt and condemnation and fear and you can die in it and go to hell. Or you can say, no, I've heard a message tonight, a message of hope, a message of strength and power in Jesus. I can come home. I can come back. Oh, hallelujah. When Jonah began to pray in the belly of the well, I believe God started drying up a nice spot somewhere up there in that belly. And he said, just sit there now and worship me. And I believe he had a revival meeting there. And I'll tell you what, God moved on that well and swooshed him across the Mediterranean, got him up into the high places and took him out, landed that well near the shore and made him vomit. Perk, out he came. Out came a man of God, free, set free, anointed, back on schedule with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God restored everything that was destroyed and eaten. God restored it. God wants to restore everything the devil has taken from you. He wants to give everything back to you in good measure. Well, yeah, I got it. Jeremiah, I found it. Jeremiah 3, and I'm going to close. I knew there was something yet. I thought it was finished, but just the scripture here. Jeremiah 3. Oh, here's a good part. Go to verse 20. Jeremiah 3, verse 20 through 22. Surely, as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. In other words, you backslid on me. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplication of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the God, the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I, what, will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. I'll tell you what, go to Jeremiah 15, please. I'm sorry, one more. Jeremiah 15. Will you stand while we read this? Backslider, listen to it. Therefore, thus, verse 19, Jeremiah 15. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vow, thou shalt be my mouth. Let them return unto thee, but return not unto them. In other words, if you'll just walk away from your old crowd, walk away from what you've been doing, turn to me. I, and I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. In other words, the devil is going to try to keep you away, but the Lord says they're not going to be able to prevail against you. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked and will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. I will pull you out of the belly's well and I'll set you free. Oh God, oh God, speak tonight. To those who have been running from you, those who are cold and indifferent, they've taken a step toward, uh, away from you, Lord. Oh, God, bring them back tonight. Bring them back tonight. Could we sing, Just As I Am, Just As I Am, without one for me to be an evangelist. And I've been his evangelist tonight. And I love to preach evangelism because I know, I know the faithfulness of God. Up in the balcony, I want every backslider. Now that takes a great confession. 
Great honesty. Every backslider downstairs here, <clears throat> get out of your seat now and get up here and say, Lord, I'm in the belly of the well. I want deliverance. I want deliverance. I want it tonight. I want it now. Get out of your seat and run down and get down here quick and say, oh, God, oh, God, I don't want the devil to claim my soul. I don't want to go this way anymore. I'm sick and tired of this. Lord, I'm coming home. Come on, get up. You see, up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come on down. Move in close, please. There'll be a lot of people coming. Take another step. Step back. Turn around and come home. Turn all the way around and say, no, devil, I'm not going your way. No, I'm not going to that temptation. No, I'm not going to turn away. If you've made even one step, turn around and come on back. Join these that are coming right now. Look this way, please. The Holy Spirit just whispered something in my heart. The Holy Spirit told me to ask you a question. It has to do with a question from the heart of Jesus. Listen to it now. Jesus is asking, are you ready to walk all the way with me now? Are you ready to lay down everything in this world? Are you willing to walk away from everything that has your heart and come and give me everything? That's the question. Are you ready to walk away from everything in this world? And say, Jesus, I want to get free and I want to give you everything, but you're going to have to help me. If you'll make that commitment, yes, I'm ready to walk with Jesus. I'm ready to give him my life and my heart. I don't want anything in this world to stand between me and Jesus now. How many can say that with a raised hand? Raise your hand if you can say that. And leave it there while you pray this prayer with me right now. Pray it from the innermost part of your being. Dear Jesus, let me hear it. Dear Jesus, from my heart, I confess my sins. Sprinkle your blood on my heart. Cleanse me and forgive me. Lord Jesus, I don't want to walk toward the world. I don't want to leave you, Jesus. Draw me back right to your spirit, into your heart. Come, Lord Jesus. Be everything to me. The best I know how. In simple faith, I give you my heart. I give you my life. And I'm returning to your love. Fill me with your love. Send the Holy Spirit. And give me power to live for you, Jesus. And to resist the devil. And to get victory over every lust in my life. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing so many backsliders back home. Lord, I know that some of these that are standing here going through a terrible time, they've had a battle, Lord, with their conscience. They've had a battle with fear, condemnation. Many of them, Lord, came to this church tonight deep in the pits of despair and depression. And Lord, there's something now that you've said to them. You've said, I'm still there. I'm still waiting. And I've allowed all this pain in your life just to make you sick and tired of the world. I've allowed all this. This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I have a prophetic word this morning. Uh, it's been quite a while since the Lord has entrusted me to bring a prophetic message, but this is very strong in my heart. I want you to turn to Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, my message, in one hour, everything's going to change. In one hour. 24th chapter, 
of Isaiah. I'm going to read just the first few verses. And then you leave your Bible open because I'm going to keep coming back to this. It's the prophecy is all here. It's not my prophecy. It's, uh, it's the Lord's prophecy given through Isaiah, his holy prophet. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turns it upside down and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. It shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, and with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, the seller, as with the lender, the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so the giver of usury. Land shall be emptied and spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. Father, in love and brokenness, I come to this congregation with something that you placed on my heart, something prophesied many, many years ago, aimed at this very generation and this time. Lord, I pray that you awaken our hearts, that, that we would not tremble, we would not fear, but we would trust your word to bring strength to us. Now, Lord, come upon me by your Holy Spirit. Let me speak the word of the living God with confidence and faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God, through the prophet Isaiah said, a time is coming. God said, I'm going to turn everything upside down. And the scripture makes it very clear. It says, behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down. There's a sudden judgment coming to this world. And it's at the door. And I want you to hear what the prophet Isaiah is saying. It's not my message. Now, if you're tied to this world, if you're in love with the things of this world and you are not walking with the Lord, you're not wanting to hear, you will not want to hear this. And you may want to just cast it aside and say, well, I'll endure this message. It, 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 and even if you are a born again Christian, if you love the Lord and you're close to him, if you didn't believe that this is the pure word of God, there may be a tendency not to take it serious. But this is the word of God. It is not man's prophecy. There are a lot of prophecies going forth in the world, and, and they are, uh, I don't know whether you would call them scripturally based or not, but this is scripture. This is the living word of God. And if you believe this is the pure word of God, then you have to open your heart to what the prophet Isaiah has to say this morning. In one hour, the world is going to change, the scripture says. In fact, when you get to Revelation 8th chapter, John warned in one day, death and mourning, yea, in one hour, an utter burning and judgment will come. That's the 18th chapter of Revelation. And it confirms that this is going to happen. Jesus said it's going to be when all men cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes, a sudden unexpected destruction comes from the hand of the Lord. Isaiah warns that there, he mentions a city. In fact, a number of prophets do, but most uh, eminent Bible scholars, and I've checked through my library, and they believe, as I do, that this prophecy that we're hearing this morning from Isaiah is, at, is, is directed to this generation. In just a moment, I'll enlarge on that and tell you why I believe we can pinpoint it into our very generation, our time. In one day, in one hour, and he says at that time, there, there was going to be a great burning. Now, secular prophets and those in homeland security, whether it's in the United States or England or Germany, all over the world now, they, they are saying that, that there is going to come a nuclear accident or a nuclear holocaust coming to a city. They often name New York City. You, you know what's happened here. You, you, we lived through the 9-11 experience. And you could look out of the apartment, especially where we are, and you could see the burning and see the fire and the smoke ascending to heaven. And a few weeks ago, remember the eruption of the steam pipe and uh, the earth opened up and swallowed a truck and you saw pictures of people running everywhere and they're screaming, is this it, is this it? They're thinking nuclear. And 
the scripture says, if, when you go through Isaiah, the 24th chapter, it, it says that the gates are going to be dissolved. The gates are going to be uh Devastated. That means the exits and entrances. We don't know where it is. The city is named and a burning and a fire is mentioned here. I've been prophesying for a number of years that uh, of something I saw when I was on the street and in <clears throat> on uh, Broadway and 42nd Street. And it's come back to me many, many times of a thousand bur- fires burning in this particular city we, in which we live. But you see, I don't know where it is. He doesn't name the city, but he does say that there, there, there is going to be a sudden destruction that's going to change everything. The world is going to change in one hour. The church is going to change in one hour. And we as individuals are going to change in one hour. Now, this message is not to frighten. Because if, if you're confident that you're saved and under the blood of Christ... And redeemed, you know that anything like this happens, it's instant glory. We pass from life into death. And like the Apostle Paul said, we should be of this mindset that we thank God for this world. We thank God for our life. But our preference is to go and be with Christ. That should be the desire in your heart. The scripture said the fear of death is a dominion. It's a terror. And Paul said, you've lived all your life that way. But he said, God says he doesn't want you to live that way. He wants to deliver us from the fear of death. And if we lose the fear of death through trusting in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not fear no matter what happens, what the newscast is, what anybody says, or a message such as this. You, you will only be moved to awaken to what the, the Lord says to do. And but let me not get ahead of myself here. We don't know where this is going to happen. First of all, the hour is going to come when the whole world is going to change. Now, eminent Bible scholars believe that chapter 24 and 25 of Isaiah have to do with our time this very day. A sudden cataclysmic event is going to strike. And the Bible, Isaiah says, the lofty, this is... 26 verse 5, the lofty, meaning the proud city, will be laid low even to the ground. Bible, then, according to the prophet, there is utter chaos. And folks, you can go out in the street here on this Sunday afternoon, go right outside the door on a sunny day, and say, how could it happen that in one hour there could be such confusion where government can't do anything about it. Societal agencies can't do anything about it because even when 9-11 struck this city, they came from all over the world. They poured in from all the United States, firemen, police officers, and helpers, and uh, there was uh, armies of people wanting to help. But folks, this cataclysmic event makes very, is made very clear in the scripture it's going to be beyond human ability to cope with. And, and even now, we, we listen to our secular prophets, and they they talk about trying to prepare. But there, there is there's coming a day that in one hour, society changes, a whole world changes. The Bible says the merchants will weep and weep and wail and cry because no one is buying their merchandise. They are all sellers and no buyers. This past week, the <clears throat> Director or the CEO of a large fund put his 142 foot yacht for sale. His 16 bedroom house in Aspen went up for sale because his high risk funds are fading and he's in deep trouble and it happened overnight. And, and now all of these risk funds, mortgage companies going bankrupt left and right. And and we are facing an incredible monster economic upheaval. I've been warning about that. I stood in this pulpit a year ago, this Sunday, I think it was, or or within one or two Sundays, warning about the mortgage market and telling people if you're flipping houses and you don't know how to do that, you're not a real estate agent, get out. We warned about that. And because... You say, well, why warn? What's the purpose of that? Why don't you just wait till it happens? Why live on any kind of anxiety? Why put this burden upon us? But remember what Jesus said 
when he first saw the destruction of Jerusalem, he said, there's going to be a, this city is going to burn to the ground. And he said, I'm telling you now so that when it happens, you'll believe. You'll believe that there is a God who so loved you. He warns you. And, and he, he said, that it, there's going, this, this, this city is going to the ground and there won't be one stone left upon another in the temple. And Jesus warned. He said, now, I'm warning you for a reason. So that when it happens, when you see these things come up, you'll understand that you were loved. And, and Paul the Apostle, when he's talking about the sudden destruction, he called that information light. He said, you're members of the body walking in light. You're getting Holy Ghost insight. He said, you're not in the darkness. You won't walk in darkness. So that when these sudden things come, and, and there's panic all around you. There's going to be something happen to you by the Holy Spirit. There's going to be something that quickens you and say, well, my God warned me. There were true, two word, true words that came forth from the pulpit and we were, we were warned. Even though in this day of prosperity, nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But folks, it is here and I'll tell you why this message is being brought forth this morning before our close. He said, the dreams are going to fade. He, he goes on to say that the music is going to fade, of, of the zithers or the guitars, and, and the, the, uh, there's, there's going to be such a change. Everything's going to change in this world in one hour. If, if there were a nuclear attack on Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, any city in Israel, I told you about the Samson option. And, and they have such a radar system. They have such protective uh, equipment that as soon as a missile's released toward Israel, within moments, they have about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, according to some experts, and retaliatory missiles would hit and strike and wipe out every enemy of Israel. Folks, I'm going to talk to you in just a, a moment about why I believe that the, the, that the prophet Isaiah is talking about our day. First of all, by the growing number of prophets warning of an apocalyptic moment coming. Now, when I talk about prophets, I'm not talking about just church prophets. I'm talking about secular prophets because God uses secular prophets. These are experts. These are scientists. And remember in the scripture, God said of, of Assyria, Assyria is my rod against Israel to correct them. In other words, Assyria is doing my will. I am speaking through Assyria to my people. And remember also about Cyrus. The scripture said of Cyrus, he's a heathen king. And when you get to Amos, Amos the prophet said, Cyrus is God speaking through him, said, Cyrus is my shepherd and he's doing my bidding. So when, when you hear all of these secular uh, scientists and all of these these are not church people. These are not religious people. They're, they are saying it's at the door. Uh, what about the sensuality? What about all of this nonchalance? What about this racing for money and gold and greed? Wall Street has become the greediest source of, of, of vile corruption in man's history. They have taken this nation into such risk and such depth, there, debt, there is no way out of it. And we live right at the foot of, we, it's right at the, <clears throat> just blocks away from where I'm preaching this morning. And the second reason, you, you see, what I'm preaching this morning is mild compared to what I hear now. Is that right or wrong? What you hear in the news and what you hear constantly fed so that we just want to turn it off. But you see, God moves. God moves in <clears throat> these, these are the warning times when 
prophets are speaking because the scripture says the Lord <clears throat> will do nothing until he speaks through his prophets, through Amos. God said, I don't do anything until I warn through my prophets. And the second reason why I believe we can assume that what Isaiah is warning speaks to our generation. God always moves in judgment. He always acts when the cup of violence overflows. Violence. Now, folks, let me speak plainly to you from the depths of my soul. I'm not a prophet. I've never claimed to be a prophet. I'm a watchman, just one of many. But listen to me now. There is no greater violence in the sight of God than the violence of pedophiles, those who are raping children, those who are stealing children right off the streets and taking them to to the Far East and putting them in brothels in India and all the, the Far East. And, and here in the United States, an entire church denomination paying hundreds of millions of dollars to settle lawsuits because their little children were sodomized. Folks, when you turn to Dafar and you find that hundreds and even thousands of little children were shedded to death. When you think of the thousands and thousands of Babies aborted in the United States and around the world. And that blood cries from the ground. And the Bible says God destroyed Noah's age because the earth was filled with violence. And God said, I can't handle it anymore. I can't take it. I will not take it. And he was patient for 120 years of strong, faithful preaching, a prophetic word. And then God saw and folks, I believe now, think of the, the murdering in our schools, the, the terrorizing of our children. You can, you can hard, what are we doing, getting hardened to the news? Does it not move us anymore? I can tell you it moves the heart of God. And I believe that blood cries from the ground. How long do you think God will endure? How long do you think God will put up with this? Even here now, on the Internet, a pedophile is taking pictures and, and telling pedophiles where to go to find the children where it's easiest to pick up a child. And he's allowed to do it and had, can't be stopped. Folks, that's all going to change. This is all going to change in one hour. And secondly, sudden destruction. <clears throat> when it comes. Is going to change the church. In one hour, the church is going to change. It's going to change dead churches. It's going to change live churches. The prophet pictures a great shaking as though God took an olive tree that had already been harvested and he begins to shake it. In other words, there's been a harvest, but there's still God said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. I'm going to turn everything upside down, according to the prophet. In this time of shaking, though, something is going to happen that's so incredible. If you have your Bibles <clears throat> open, I want you to go to verse 14. Now, before you do that, don't get ahead of me, please. Look this way. Now, remember, this is a time of, of cataclysmic devastation. This is a time that's so incredibly dark. This is a time of fire. And in the middle of that... What about God's people? What's happening in the church? The apostasy is going to change overnight. Everything that we see that is wrong in the church of Jesus Christ is going to change. But in the house of God, there's going to be a revival. And I want you to see it, folks. And if you... It, it, this when I, I saw it and began to pray over it and began to study and do my research on this, 
See, this is not, I didn't get along with God and pray and say, God, talk to me. Put in my head what's going to happen. I have people all over the world, wherever I travel, say, Brother Dave, you speak of prophetic. What's, what's next? What's coming? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'll go to my Bible. If God speaks it through his word, then I believe it, and then I'll preach it. So I see this, and it makes me shout. I know what's coming, and you know what's coming. But folks think God's interest is in his church, in the church of Jesus Christ, his overcoming church. And the Bible said in the middle of this, there's going to be a song rise up. From the islands of the sea, from the uttermost parts of the world, there's going to be a song rise up in the middle of all of this. Look at it, verse 14. Then shall they lift up, first, verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there's going to be a great shaking. What's happening during the shaking? Verse 13, verse 14. Then they, in other words, they shall lift up their voice, they shall sing, for the majesty of the Lord, they shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify you the Lord in the fires. Did you hear it? <laughs> there should be an amen coming from the glory of your soul. Because in the middle of the fire, God's going to have a people who are not in panic. God is going to have a people that are going to praise the majesty of Almighty God. He said, in the fires you will sing. There's a song coming to the church of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're not going down. We're going up. We are going up. There shall be a song in the midst of the fire. <clears throat> Verse 16, for the, from the uttermost part of the earth, have we heard what? Not weeping, not groaning, not murmuring, not complaining. Not agonizing that you hear a song coming from China and then you hear it from India. You hear it coming out of the tribes of Africa, out of Darfur, out of every nation. It's coming from every island of the sea. It's coming from the United States and Canada, South America, the whole world, for the uttermost part of the world. I hear a song, the prophet said. I hear it. I hear people who are facing calamity. I hear people that are. Seemingly have no hope, and there's a song. There's a choir. We heard over 150 voices here this morning singing. Can you imagine the great sound that was coming out of the 150? Can you imagine millions and millions of people around the world singing the song when this hour comes? It's coming in the darkest time of all. I, I, I believe that, <clears throat> that something's going to happen among our youth, especially college students. Do you understand that for, for the past 10 years especially, our children, our young people are going into colleges and their faith is being robbed? That ungodly atheistic teachers and professors have our young people as prisoners for three, four, five, and six years. And they keep bombarding them till there's no faith. They, they leave believing there is no God. Till I can sweeten 80% of the people now say that the population that there's no God. Don't believe in God. 20% believe in God. And many, many students and folks, I believe that's going to change because in one hour when everybody is waking and when the world is shaking and trembling, those professors are going to be looking for somebody to give them a word. Prosperity preachers are going to get their Bibles out looking for something to say to the people saying, what's happened? Why didn't you warn us? But I believe that in that time, everything in college is going to change. Oh, yes. All the survivors. You see, this is not, I'm not talking about the end of the world. There's still ahead. There's, the, 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 things are going to change in one hour. But there's still, we're talking about in the future beyond that, the Antichrist. And, but you see, the Antichrist can't come to power until there's chaos. It has to come out of chaos. Hitler came out of chaos. The Antichrist is going to come out of a chaotic world where he, there, there is something of wisdom. There's something given to him with demonic power that brings people some kind of hope. I'm talking about the secular world. But folks, this is all about to change. 
And the Bible says we as individuals are going to change. In one hour, we're going to have our focus in life changed, our entire focus. We will no longer be obsessing about our own problems and adversities. We won't, be, we won't be focused on me. We won't be focused on our problems. As serious as they are and, and as challenging as they may be, God, it's very clear. This will not be our focus. That's all going to be changed. Everything that was once dear to us is, is no longer going to have value it's, it, other than those things that are of the spirit and of love and of Christ. Things that we held dear are, are going to be held and, and absolutely are going to vanish by this, meaning the calamity, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged when he turns all the stones into dust. This is Isaiah 27, 9. He said, I'm going to take all the islands. And he said, by this, in other words, this great cataclysmic event, is going to bring down all the idols. All the idols are going to be crushed to stone, is what the Bible says. Here's the promise from the book of Isaiah, 27th chapter. He said, in that day, all the idols will be trampled to dust. They're not going to... The last thing the world's going to be talking about is sports. I have nothing in sports. I like sports. I'm a football fan. But, you know, the Bible says... I, it's going to be good. They're not going to be any more $250 million settlement for these people in a starving world. He said it's all going to change. It goes even deeper than that. Let me find it here in the scripture. It shall be. Here's where we're going to be in a level field. Listen to this very please. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with his mistress, or the buyer and the seller, as with the lender and the buyer. Everything will be brought to a same level, whether it's presidents, world leaders, those in poverty, all going to face the same struggles, the same conditions. <clears throat> Nothing will There'll be no respecter of persons. Are you ready for some comfort? <laughs> I said, are you ready for some comfort? Yes. Folks, I don't like to preach like this. For the last six weeks, I've preached nothing but grace. I risk people getting mad. Every time I've had to preach much like this, people leave. But one day I stand before God. And he said, if you see these things coming and you don't warn, the blood's on your hand. And I read that and tremble. There should be no one that comes to Times Square Church surprised. Should, you don't sit around waiting for things to happen. But let me tell you what Paul the Apostle said. I want you to follow this very closely before I close. Paul said, <clears throat> He has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, whether we, we, we will live together with him. He said, comfort yourself. He, he's talking about sudden destruction. He's talking about time that we're going to be with the Lord. And he said, I want you to comfort one another. Comfort one another. And he said, whether we live or die. And folks, that's where we have to come to right now. You, you, you watch the news in the next 30 days, and especially the next two weeks. Listen to, to what's happening to the economy. Listen and just remember God speaking, not to make you afraid, but to prepare your heart. He said, you're to put on the breastplate of faith. This is Paul the Apostle said, in these times, when we live under the threat of a sudden destruction or the knowledge of a sudden destruction coming on the earth, when, when, when this has been told to us and when we see it and we hear it, 
He, he said, you're not to tremble. You're not to sorrow as the world sorrows. He said, no. He, he said, you go about comforting one another and speak to one another, saying, live or die, we're the Lord's. Now, it comes down to this. Co- going to your friends, going to the body of Christ, went after them and say, cans, and look right in the eye and say, live or die, we're the Lord's. That's what Paul said. You're going to encourage one another and say, we live or die. We will go and live with Christ. We are headed for eternal life in Christ. Folks, I'm asking God, and I, I more and more, you say, well, you can come to that because you're old man now. But you see, I'm coming to a place now where I'm not going to live in fear. I don't live in fear. I want to be here in the United States. I want to be here in New York City if anything happens to this city. I want to be here in the middle of it. And I don't want the fear of death to have dominion over me. And you can't have freedom. You can't have freedom until you comfort yourself with the word of God, saying, I will, whatever happens, if it happens tomorrow, bless God, I'm going to be shouting on the streets of glory with all the saints of God. I'm going to pass from death into life. This, we're not to live in fear. We're not to live in bondage. You say, well, Brother Dave, you already put us in fear, and now you're trying to get us out of it. No, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. I, I, my message today is that there's a song coming out of this. And if you leave this building, if you leave this building discouraged, if you walk out of here and say that's nothing but gloom and doom, yes, it is on a human level. But on a spiritual level, it's life eternal. It's life. And I just have a secret thought in my heart. It's probably just David Wilkerson's thoughts. But I have a feeling, just as before 9-11, the Holy Spirit moved in this church and other congregations and warned us there were moments of silence. Sometime 15 minutes we sat in this church just before the blast. And God was speaking to us not to be afraid. And I, it's going to be different this time. I believe that if something is going to happen in this city or wherever it happens, the saints of God are going to be quickened by the Holy Spirit and there's going to be some singing and shouting and praising of God to encourage the body to strengthen their spirit. Now get up on your feet. I bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Folks, I've got the Holy Ghost all over me right now. I have the Holy Spirit upon my soul. He wants to come upon you. The Holy Spirit wants to quicken you. Take the fear out of your heart. You young people that are in the choir, the young people that are listening to me right now, there is a future. The whole world thinks there's no future. Folks, this is just the beginning of our future. This is just the beginning of our future. Hallelujah. I feel good. There are going to be a lot of people listening to this tape, tuned it out too quick. They turned it off. They should have stayed. And listen to the praises and the shouts of God's people in this house. (laughs) Hallelujah. There shall be a song. Somebody ask you this afternoon or tomorrow, next week, what did Pastor Dave preach? You see, revival. A song in a hard time. And I've got to say this in closing. Listen very carefully, please. You're to sing in your present fire, in your adver- ad- adversity, in your hard time, financial, whatever it may be. You've got to get a song. You say, does God expect me to sing? I don't care what it is. There should be that little quiet. There's something very quiet and steadfast in the soul that sings, great is our God. See, he said they're going to sing about the majesty of God. Great is our God. 
Folks, I walk these streets and I sing. I sing in spite of, of, of crises. I sing in spite of all those things. There's something God puts in the heart. And you've got to get your song now. That'll be too late. Get it now. Get a hold of your song. There's a song in the night, but there's a song in the fire. Some of you are in a fire. The Bible says, build up your faith. The apostle Paul said, put on the breastplate of hope, uh, uh, of faith and love and hope. Oh, praise God for the hope that is in our hearts. Now, we have a, a space here in the front of the church. We, we refer to it as the altar, another place to meet God. And I invite you, if you're here this morning, and God has spoken to you. You see, uh, God's not interested in you changing your life through fear, but through hope. And that's what this meeting is all about, hope. And you're here this morning and your hope has been staggered because you're going through a crisis in your life. And you say, well, Brother Dave, everybody's got some kind of a crisis. But I'm talking about a, a real serious thing that, that only God could give you a song. And there's been some, we call it the blues or depression. If you're standing here with the sound of my voice in the annex upstairs here, wherever we're at in this audience, and you need a touch, an absolute touch of God, you need the spirit of fear to be broken in you so you can walk out of this building. Maybe that fear is because you're not walking with Christ as you did or should. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you walked in here and you've never known what it is to have what people call a new birth or you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I invite you to get out of your seat upstairs, wherever you are, and even the balcony, in the annex. You can go to the lobby and they'll show you how to get down here in the front of this church and we will pray for you. You can come even while I'm talking. Just get out of your seat up the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come down. And we're going to believe God for a, a tremendous uh, change. Everything so change in an hour. This can change you in the next five minutes. There can be a change in your life, and the Lord can cleanse you, change your direction, and bring hope and life to your whole, your body, soul, mind, and the spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that you walk through this congregation Move through this congregation and find everyone that needs a miracle, a life-changing miracle. And those who would believe with us, would believe with us for that change in Jesus' name. And while they're singing, just get out of your seat, up in the balcony, come and join us here. We'll pray and we'll believe God for you and with you. If you don't know Christ, if you've drifted from Christ, follow these that are coming. Now, there's some, maybe many of you here this morning worried and fretting. Pastor Dave, what do, I, what do I do in the future if some of these things you're talking about even begin to happen? What do we do? What about my house, my mortgage, all of these things? The Lord comes to us with a message that casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Can, can you imagine a God who has flung into the cosmos not just this one uh, world that we're living in, not this one galaxy, but you understand that there are millions and billions of galaxies beyond ours. The, the Hubble uh, telescope has discovered not just uh, billions of, they're talking about billions of universes. Can you imagine? Endless. And a God who can keep all of that in order. Can't he keep our lives in order? My goodness.
And, and, and we have preached faith so long. We have toyed with faith. We have imagined we have faith. We have talked and preached and, and, and tried to test it and all. But, folks, that it, it is time. It is time. And the only reason I can think God would have me do this this morning is that you and I get a hold of some life-changing faith that no matter what happens, somehow God will deliver his people. And if, if, if we... If, Folks, how do you how do you explain the 16 Korean Presbyterians right now in the hands of the Afghan uh, terra, uh, Taliban? Two have been murdered, and then then we say, well, you know, the fiery furnace and the lion's den—they're all delivered, and God's not appointed us to wrath. Yes, but there's there, there are two, and they're dying one at a time. There are martyrs under the throne of God, multitudes of martyrs crying out that their blood be avenged, F- folks. We've got to be honest about it. We've got to be honest. I'm not going to play games with the church of Jesus Christ. You and I have, you and I have to be prepared to die for Jesus if necessary. And we will go through hard times. But if a God can, if a God can keep this world in orbit and there's a whole cosmos moving in their orbits and in their places and can you imagine a God who's named every billions of stars, every multiplied billions of stars, he's named them all. So he sure knows my name. He knows my name and he knows your name. God, help us to believe God and get a song in our trial. Father, in Jesus' name, we fight against doubt and unbelief and this cast down spirit. Lord, help us to face the days ahead with Holy Ghost courage. And you are a strong tower. And we can run into you and be safe. We are safe in Christ. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, give me confidence in the days ahead. And I trust in you. And help me, O Lord, to cast my cares upon you. Forgive my sins, Lord. Forgive my unbelief. Come by your Holy Spirit. Lift my spirit. Put joy in my heart. And a song in my heart. Of praise and glory to your holy name. Now let me pray again for the Father. Sweep over this congregation in the annex. The overflow rooms into the balcony and the choir loft and the pulpit and this whole house. Sweep over us with the gentle spirit of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just breathe upon us now as we walk out into the sunlight of this day. Let us realize, Lord, that this is not the sun that we're looking for. We thank you for it. But, oh, Lord, we, we go into a city where you are the sun. You are the brightness of the day. And, Lord, you will wipe away every tear and you will strengthen us. Lord, We anticipate your coming. We anticipate the soon return of Jesus Christ, our Lord, from glory. Hallelujah. Will you now just thank him for his faithfulness to you? Lord, I thank you. This is the conclusion of the message.
flood my 